Let's stand and give God praise tonight to a holy God, to a righteous God. Praise him now with nothing but your voices and your hands. Lord, this place has been full of your presence all night long. And uh, God, we just want to stop and acknowledge you. We've been blessed by great singing and great music. These people have given their offerings tonight to support your work of propagating the gospel in this camp meeting. So now, God, I know you've got something special for this congregation. And it's not Anthony Mangan, it's you. There's going to be people that's going to be healed by your blood tonight. There's going to be people that's going to be filled with your spirit tonight, evidenced by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. So God, right now, we've just come to tell you, you take over. We're going to worship and praise you. We're going to magnify your name. Then God, we expect you to do what singing can't do. We expect you to do what preaching can't do. We expect you to do what no man can do. Miracles will happen in this place tonight. We speak it in the name of Jesus. Oh, man, I've just been rejoicing. I've been having trouble sitting down over there. I remember when I was a kid on 16th and Day Street and Daddy would get up or Mother would start and she'd start singing something like, sit down. And the congregation would holler back, I can't sit down. Somebody would say, sit down. They'd say, I can't sit down. And that old timer would say, sit down. Then somebody would say, I can't sit down because I just got religion and I can't sit down. So if you wonder if you're a guest with us tonight, I know a lot of you came here and this is your first time in a Pentecostal service. But when you get God on the inside of you, evidenced by the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. I know you may think we're a little crazy and you really need to pray for us. You need to pray we get worse. Because we love praising God. Because Paul said, some of us used to be liars. Some of us used to be adulterers. Some of us used to be drunkards. But by the grace of God, we've been delivered by the power. So when we begin to think about where we were and then we begin to think about where we're going, I know you think we're crazy, but let me ask you who the crazy one is. You're going to a city whose builder and maker's God. Now think about it. If you're a religion person here and you don't understand what's going on, let, let's just stop here and do a little figuring here. Let's, let's take this and just put it over here in just a moment. Let's just think. We're going to a place where there's no more sorrow, sickness, pain, or death. Where the streets of gold and the walls are made of jasper. But more than that, Jesus is going to be there. Now, now who would you think was the crazy ones? Those that know they're going there, but they sit there like Mount Rushmore? Or those that know they're going there and they got to shout in their soul. They got to clap in their hand. They got praise in their heart. When you just get to thinking about going to heaven, it brings a shout. We're so very glad to have all of our guests, but you're going to leave here differently than you came. You're going to leave here differently than you came. God's getting ready to do something great for you. 
And then to this great church, embodied believers of the churches and the great pastors and evangelists and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists of the North Texas district, it's an honor that Mickey and I have to get to be with you, such an honor. And to be with your wonderful superintendent and wife, brother and sister Flowers, and to be with brother and sister Holly, your secretary, and this great district board. I love every one of these men and women and they have great visions and plans for the North Texas district. And to be here with the Texas district superintendent, brother and sister Prince, that is a great honor. Brother Gurley texted me this afternoon and he was coming in, but his plane got canceled. Now it would have been great to have had Texas, South Texas and North Texas superintendent. That would have been the Holy Trinity. That would have been wonderful. But it's just been great being here and this, this place is packed tonight and there are thousands watching on the web. And I, I believe somebody's gonna get the Holy Ghost watching this tonight. Now thank you. I wanna thank the great church of the POA, the Pentecostal of Alexandria. They allow Mickey and I to travel and they give us liberty to do that and they're such great people. We're in a tremendous revival right now. We're brother and sister Tisdale. We were going to close this weekend, but the revival has broken out. We're going on until the next weekend and until God gets through. So pray that, pray that God gives POA a mighty revival, amen? <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1 and 4. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Genesis 14 and 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and he pursued them unto Dan. My subject is again tonight. This is our day and this is our time. One more time tonight before you're seated. Would you give God praise, listen, for the great music, for the teaching and the preaching that we've had in this camp meeting and for what God is going to do in the next 40 or 45 minutes in this place. Could you put your Bibles down and give him a shout like he deserves tonight. God bless you. you, may be seated. This is the generation that has come. It's a new generation for a brand new day. No new doctrine, no new cart for the Ark of the Covenant. It's the same old path that the apostles trod, but we're now taking new territory. We're lengthening our cords, but we're also strengthening our stakes because the same old time religion is working with some brand new methods. I stand before you to preach to you about something old, but something that is brand new. For I think that God is bringing the generations together of the apostolic church where we can still sing our fly away where we can still sing, won't it be wonderful there? But we can also turn and sing, he turned my morning into dancing. It's the combination of singing hymns with new worship praises. God is working in a new day and bringing new victories. The new generation that has come, they have songs of victory. So I am going to sing the songs a victory with them in our travels and am, I am seeing in that generational church that God has allowed me to pastor following my father and mother. I am seeing the former rain and the latter rain come together as the apostle Peter in his message on the day of Pentecost when he was quoting from the prophet Joel in chapter 2, 16 through 18. 
He said, and it shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and oh my servants and oh my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. I love where we are in the apostolic church. Old men dreaming dreams, but young men and women, sons and daughters, handmaidens and servants, prophesying in the name of Jesus. It's the old and the young coming together and prophesying. There has never been a day in the history of the book of Acts church, like this day and time. He didn't save one of the apostles for the last day. He took the 12 apostles for the foundation to build the church, but he thought of enough of me and you to raise up us in the last days, which would be the toughest day of living. And he said in that day and time, I will have apostles and I will have prophets and I will have teachers and I will have evangelists that will evangelize the world. It's a day like no other day. It's a day of gladness and feasting, sending portions one to another and to those for whom nothing is prepared. I tell this great church tonight, it's revival time. As someone as well said, I was born in the fire, I can't live in the smoke. I was born in revival and I won't live without revival. I said it last night, I made my mind up, I'm gonna declare war on every dead church, every dead person that's in the apostolic church, I declare war on it. We've come here, devil, to let you know something. This church is getting ready to wake up like we've never been awake. And we're becoming fanatics about what God has given us. And like Winston Churchill said, a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change his subject. So I'm a fanatic about Jesus Christ and I won't change my mind and I won't change my subject. I was blessed to be born into a revival home. I was reared in a revival church. We slept revival. We ate revival. Every staff day was a revival. I was in it with my first birth because I was born to GA in Vestamangan. Then I got it by second birth. My dad talked to God by night and he preached for people and went after people by day. And he had the ability to pass that on to me. I realized in the last few weeks that my pastor has been so sick. When my father was promoted to glory seven years ago last week, my father had not been gone 20 minutes when Brother Tinney walked in and I asked him to become the pastor of my family. Brother Tinney came so sick three or four weeks ago and became very low at that time to where they didn't know if really Brother Tinney was going to make it. He was very critical and they were not releasing the information, but Brother Tinney was very, very ill. And it dawned on me that I will soon be 68 years old and I am now becoming an elder or I am an elder amongst the apostolic church for the men like Brother Barnes who were men gifted by faith and the men like my father who was used mildly of God and many of your fathers that I can't start naming that God used to help bring this church to where it is. 
they had the ability to pass something on to us. And they placed something into my hands that I refused to be ordinary with it. I refused to be common with it. I refused to just go through the motions. I was born in the fire and I'm not gonna live in the smoke. So as an elder of this church, as an elder now in the United Pentecostal Church, I come here tonight to tell you young people and to tell you young married couples, if I say anything tonight that your pastor disagrees with, listen to me closely. Your pastor is right and I am wrong because I'm gonna say some things tonight and if your pastor disagrees with me, he is right and I am wrong. But I have reached the point to where we don't need to put an age limit on how old somebody has to be before they can be used of God. I'm going to protect something that's been handed to me. Jehoshaphat, whose name means Jehovah is her earth. She saved Joash, the heir apparent. Jehoiada, her high priest's husband, guarded him, helped to crown him. He set the sentries at the temple door. They organized the bodyguard. They gathered the Levites. They armed the remaining loyal troops with weapons. In fact, it was David's own weapons that they got from the temple army. Yet it was Jehosheba, that courageous woman who stole her Joash from among the corpses of the king's son and hid him for six years in the temple while that murders Athaliah. You let me tell you something. God has a room that the devil can't find. She took him to a room that Athaliah couldn't find. Thus, this great woman, Jehoshaphat, goes the credit of preserving, of preserving the seed royal. For had Joash perished, Judah would have been extinct. And the seed royal from generation to generation through whom the Savior would come and the oracles of God would be given and the Bible would have been written, that seed royal would have been extinct. But because of one woman said, I am going to preserve the apostolic revival and the apostolic truth, and I'm gonna make sure it gets pushed on to the next generation. They produced a Jesus in their downline. God's covenant with Adam and Eve was contained two interdependent provisions. He told Adam and Eve, you will produce descendants and they will have dominion. Two people alone could not take dominion of the earth. So God said, I'm going to require it of you that you get descendants and for us to take dominion of the revival of this world that God wants to give the apostolic church. We can't do this with just we preachers alone. We can't do this with just pastors alone. We can't do this with just evangelists alone. Tonight, I am telling you that everybody in this room is declared to be part of the last day revival. God has entrusted to me. If your pastor disagrees, he is right and I am wrong. But tonight, 
in the name of Jesus and by the authority that he has placed in me for this service tonight. I am releasing everyone in this room to a new apostolic ministry, to a new apostolic touch. The way, I didn't say this, I didn't even say this in Mississippi when I was along these lines. But when God spoke to me this afternoon, the way that God spoke to me, there is nobody. I don't care if you've been saved 50 million years. Then there's standing room only all the way around the walls. There is nobody in this room that is supposed to leave this room the way you came. You just thought you were doing something. You just thought you were saved. You just thought you were worshiping God. God has come here to transform me. God has come here to transform you. Brother Flowers, God has come here to do something in you and Sister Flowers tonight to lead this district. There's impartation in this room tonight. It's every hand on board. It's everybody in. Quit your mumming and complaining. Quit griping about everybody. Quit griping about everything that's wrong in the church. Start looking at what's right in the church. Start looking at what God's doing. We pastors aren't perfect. We make mistakes. We're not afraid to ask for forgiveness. My God, we're not perfect. Let us breathe a little bit. Let our families breathe a little bit. Get in there and hold our hands up. Come on, let's have revival together. God wanted to see what we're gonna do tonight. He told Abraham, he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. He said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not held, withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which are upon the sea, and thy seed shall possess the gate of the enemy. Now, let me put the Mangan translation on it. The Lord said, because thou hast not withheld, thou young people, the coming generation, the royal seed of apostolic authority and descendants and dominion, God said, I will bless thee. I will multiply thy seed. The now generation that is coming, it's not a shall, it's not a maybe so. They shall possess the gates of the enemies. Behold, I give you power to tread on scorpions. You have authority over everything. You have authority over every devil and demon. You have authority over everything that's coming against you. The gates of hell can't prevail against you. We're gonna train you. You young people have it. You're the seed royal. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness and then shall the end come. Tonight, I beg you pastors. Tonight, I beg you preachers. Release our sons and daughters. They are ready. They may not be ready to pastor, but they're ready to go. I 
am not going to leave it to the 60 plus to bring revival at POA. I'm not going to let our young people just get to play in the game when we're way ahead. I am declaring to you tonight at the Pentecost of Alexandria, I am going to take the high school students and the college and career students and I'm going to empower them because they're getting ready to bring the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. Genesis 14, 14. I started a group in Alexandria. About a year ago, I started a group. I called them the Genesis group. They're our college and career. I'm putting into them once a month, every Saturday night. It said, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house. 318 pursued them unto Dan. Notice three things. They were armed. They were trained servants and they had been born in his house. If we can arm our young people, if we can train our young people and those that's been born in our house, you're getting ready to see the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. They're taking over. They're taking over to Alexandria. We now get through when Brother Tisdale gets through preaching on Sunday night. I take in Sister Tisdale. There are two wonderful children out to eat. What does our Genesis group do? They're going to the upper room and they're having 40 to 50 every Sunday night. That's having prayer meetings. They're having message in tongues interpretation. You said, you mean you're not there to watch over it? Nope. Well, what if they get off into wildfire? I got enough wet blankets to put them out. My problem's not the wildfire. My problem's the wood so wet they can't get a fire. I wish I did have a problem with that. It's time that we release our young people in the gifts of tongues, in the gift of interpretation, in the gift of prophecy, in the gift of healing. I was coming in three Saturdays ago and Waikisha was coming by and they had three of them with them and, and that Genesis crew was coming in. I said, where y'all been? They said, oh, pastor, we've been out to our bus route families. And I said, well, you got them coming? Yeah, but we didn't go to the kids. We went to the parents and we took them things to eat and we took them clothing and a bunch of them are gonna be here to hear Brother Tisdale in the morning, pastor. How old are those people? They're 19. They're 20 and they're 21 years of age. The revival that God is getting ready to give the United Pentecostal Church. That's why you've got 32,000 scheduled for Youth Congress in a couple of weeks. It's because our young people. so tired of hearing of what they can't do and what they don't believe. You better believe something. We got a group of young people. They love the new birth. They love the one God message. They love the Christian disciplines. They love holy and godly living, but they also got a desire to be used mightily of God. And tonight, turn them loose. If in this organization, we remove the hope of tomorrow, today will become meaningless for us. May God revolutionize our thinking and give us an overwhelming sense of conviction about this matter in our hearts right now. I am preaching to evangelists and to pastors and to teachers and to leaders that we can train, that we can develop. I'll tell you how I learned to swim. 
We were the place, they didn't have swimming pools back then. But Carl McKellar and Kenneth Phillips, when I was just nine, 10 years old, they were evangelists out of our church. They took me to a place called Fish Creek. And they said, one, two, three. And I went about 10 foot of water. You know what? I came up swimming. And I've been swimming ever since. I'm ready to take our young people. One, two, three. Turn them loose. Empower them with the Holy Ghost. I said, well, boy, you've gone plumb crazy about this. I ain't gone crazy about it. I'm consumed with it. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. He died before Jesus did, yet we call him old John the Baptist. So John must have died somewhere around 30 years old. We talk about Jesus. He died somewhere around 33 years old. By the time we're 30 or 33, we ought to be able to have done a great work for God already. Let no man despise your youth. The church is existing for you young people. We are turning you loose unless your pastor says otherwise. You're gonna be used in the gifts of the spirit. Divers tongues are gonna rest upon you. I am passing the baton tonight to another generation. That's what happened 6,000 years ago. My daddy was handed it to him from Pop Mangan and Gibson. Daddy passed it to me. And tonight to this younger generation, I am passing on to you a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost. I am pressing on to you fresh power. But you are a chosen generation. Second Peter 9 and 10. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light, which in time past, you were not a people, but you're now the people of God, which had not attained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. In the beginning, until the law was given, the head of each family was the priest. Then when the law was given, he established the Aaronic priesthood. Israel should have been a kingdom of priests, but Israel violated the law and God shut up the priestly office of the Aaronic family. And he turned to the Levitical tribe, to the Levites, and he appointed the Levites to minister, thus constituting the typical priesthood. And they had that tabernacle and they would go in and that high priest would minister. Then he would go to that altar of repentance and then he'd go to that laver of water and then he would go to that curtain that he'd go through those five veils, that veil. Then he would go to the candlestick. Then he would go to the table of showbread. Then he would go to the altar of incense and then however he got through the veil, he went through the veil and only the high priest one time a year could go into that holiest of holies. But when my great God that robed himself in flesh came to this earth and when he said, it is finished, that veil was torn in twain. And now it's not the district superintendent and now it's not just the pastor and now we're a royal priesthood. Everybody had the opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies. Everybody in this room has access to God. So tonight, I am releasing you into the office of the New Testament believer that you are to operate as a priest a royal priesthood, you have that authority. First Corinthians two. Man, y'all preaching me to death tonight. 
First Corinthians 2, verses one and four. But I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of speech, of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse four, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank God. Don't anybody misunderstand me. I thank God for everyone. Both of my children got a college degree. I thank God for that. I thank God for our Bible colleges. I thank God for Urshan Theological uh, Seminary that we have. I thank God for everything that he gave us. And I'm glad that we can sit down with anybody and we can explain, we can talk, or we can debate what we believe. Paul said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Yes, Notice he said, I'm set for it because you can't score much while you're playing defense. So I want to play offense. But if you make me play defense, I'm going to defend this truth. It's not what I have to do. It's what you get to do. Some of our visitors here tonight that you can't believe in God's gonna fill you with the Holy Ghost. It's not that you have to get it, it's you get to get it. Who would want Christ in you, the hope of glory? He went to Mars Hill. He said, okay, all y'all come. So all of them came around. They said, okay, what do you think about that? Well, I believe this theology. I believe Nyan and I believe that. Paul said, well, I believe one God and his name is Jesus. They sat there and they debated and they discussed. There may have been a few people saved, but if you'll study history and you'll study the Bible, there was not a church built at Mars Hill. So when Paul left there, he realized you can't do this with just truth alone. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when he left Mars Hill and he got to Corinth, he didn't sit down and debate them over it. He said, gentlemen, I didn't come here with oratory ability. I didn't come here to try to show you my vocabulary, but I have come here in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you what, you let people start getting out of wheelchairs. You let the blind eyes open. You let the deaf ears unstop. You let cancer start falling off of people. They'll live holy. They'll live any way you want them to live if we can have a demonstration of the Spirit of God. miracles. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen at POA. I've seen those young people in this revival with the Tisdales. I've seen them slain last year and this year under the power of God. I've seen them walking up, grabbing microphones away from me. I'm watching them as they walk through the congregation, 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds, and they're laying hands on them. I watched seven and 18-year-olds come up and lay hands on their pastor. And one night, one of them laid hands on me, and I went straight out before the Lord. There is something in this generation right now that they're ready for a demonstration of the power and the glory of the Holy Ghost. Please, please, I ask my generation, please don't kill them. If they're living holy, if they believe this truth, if they believe the apostolic way, if they live and look the way we're supposed to live and look, please don't kill them. If they don't preach it just like you preached it, or if they don't sing by the same beat that you used to sing by, please let them go. They are gonna have revival in the last days. <laughs> Ty 
Titus Creel. Titus Creel has been in the Oakdale Church. Used to sing bass and they put him in Grace Home at Cabrini Hospital. They put you in Grace Home when you only got three to five days left to live. And he was totally brain dead. He knew nothing. He was gone. He was out of it. I was out of town. And a group of our men, gentry, and a guy that we won through seven. He was an addict. Hadn't been saved but just three or four years. He just feels led to do hospital ministry. And I said, well, who's trained you? And he said, well, I've been with Brother Brown a little bit. He said, but I just feel like I can do it. I said, well, go do it. So he walked in Brother Titus Creel's room. And that old addict of three or four years ago had the faith and had the new generation anointing. And he said, on the authority that God has placed in me and by the power of the blood, the word, and the name, I command you to wake up. Titus Creel woke up. When I got home, I walked in the room. He said, hey, Brother Anthony. Three days later, he went home. He's at home now, still alive. That was by a three-year-old addict. Come on, young people, you got it. Step out by faith. Step out by faith. You've got it. You've got it. You've got it. There's an anointing on you. The church has gathered weekly around our sermons. We value scripture and we need to. He said, preach the word in season, out season, and we need to. But Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. There's people that search the scriptures, but they don't have eternal life. If searching the scriptures doesn't lead you to Jesus and the supernatural, you're not searching the scriptures. Paul said, I won't dare but speak those things which Jesus have given me. The time that I'm living in, deaf ears are gonna open, blind eyes are gonna open, debt's gonna be canceled. We got home, it was one night we wasn't having, uh, had to be Memorial Day because it, before the Tisdales got there. And, and Sister Deanna Turnage has prayed in our church for uh, 47 years. And she's prayed for her husband, James Turnage, to get the Holy Ghost. And she called me on Sunday afternoon and I was tired. I mean, I had preached that day and, and Mickey and I had had a memorial time together with our fun, uh, with our family and fun and fellowship. And she called me and said, Pastor, you know, I emailed you a dream. I emailed you about two weeks ago and I saw you walking in my home and praying for my husband and he got the Holy Ghost. And she said, you know all those other things that I sent you in that dream? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, all those things have come true. Now, I've waited for 47 years. When are you coming to pray for my husband? I said, well, you know, Sister Turnage, I think I'm coming right now. Mickey and I went out there and I walked in. They lived in a little one-room trailer. And I walked in there, I said, hey, Jim, how you doing? He said, well, I haven't been doing good. They don't know how long I'm gonna live. I said, well, Jim, I've come here with a message from God. God's ready to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He began to close his eyes. I said, are you ready? He started shaking his head, yes. And Mickey can tell you, I had to shut his wife up so we could hear him talk in tongues. I reached over and laid my hands on him. And God touched him. And he began to speak a heavenly language. And the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. And after 47 years, God baptized that man with the Holy Ghost. We're at the end time. Prayers that you prayed. 47 year old prayers that you prayed. 30 year prayers that you prayed for your children. God, I got the Holy Ghost on me. 20 years of praying that you've been doing and your children are still lost on the authority of the name of Jesus. I speak healing into those prayers. I speak salvation into those prayers. I feel an impartation in this room. 
I want you to turn and lay your hands on three or four people. Go ahead and speak the truth. Healing is gonna happen right now. Speak the word right now. Healing is gonna happen right now. <laughs> 